Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. A deliberately unlawful protest is a rough definition of civil disobedience, um, so that one is protesting and uh, breaking the law in a sense, but is doing it in order to accomplish some greater good. Today on Reflections, Father Basic talks with Sister Patricia Snap, who is an associate professor of literature at Siena Heights College. Father Basic and Sister Snap will discuss civil disobedience, personal, and theological perspectives. And now, here is Father Basic. Pat, I'd like to speak a little bit about civil disobedience. And since you are a person who has been involved in acts of civil disobedience in the past, I thought you might be a good person to discuss that question with me. There's so many angles that one can take. I mean, I can get very heady about it and very objective and refer to theological sources and to try to look a little bit at what the nature of civil disobedience is and um, how, how it should be carried out and so on. But uh, maybe we just ought to define a little bit about you know what might be involved. Someone has said to deliberately... Uh, a deliberately unlawful protest is a rough definition of civil disobedience um, so that one is protesting and uh, breaking the law in a sense but is doing it in order to accomplish some greater good I don't know if that's enough to by way of general idea of what we got in mind in civil disobedience but maybe more concretely we've got the idea of people who break into uh, weapons places and hammer nose cones and get elect, uh, get uh, jailed for this and so on, example of that, or people who don't pay their their taxes and so on. But anyway, I, I want to talk about civil disobedience. I start out by saying that I could get sort of heady about it. I know you know it from the inside mm -hmm. because you've been involved in acts of civil disobedience. So I, I guess I'd like to hear you speak a little more personally about it, and maybe that will give us a feel for this question. All right, I guess I'd like to distinguish uh, a little bit more carefully between nonviolent civil disobedience and civil disobedience which might involve, you know, banging nose cones or, or pouring blood on records or, or in some way is going to be, in fact, damaging some property. Uh, I, I think there is an ideological distinction probably between those two forms of civil disobedience. What, in other words, you're saying one has a certain violence about it or destructive character That's right. and another doesn't. That's right. So if That's you hammer right. nose cones, you're liable to damage the process of the weapons there, uh, whereas um, if you don't pay your taxes, presumably you're not doing violence to anyone. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, and and I, I guess I just feel the need to include the fact that those who dent nose cones certainly have done it uh, uh, out of a conviction that what they are doing is moral and those nose cones don't have a right to exist. But I, I think we can make that differentiation because some people don't and think that everyone involved in civil disobedience is somehow being destructive and, and wanton in some way and, and, and harming things that do not belong to them. And that's simply not, not the case, wasn't the case in the, in the two acts of civil disobedience I was involved in, which, which in fact simply was praying in areas where people were not allowed to congregate, in one case in the rotunda of the Capitol, and praying for peace. Um, in the other case? In the other case, praying on the sidewalk <laughs> uh -huh. for peace, also in Washington, mm -hmm. and also as a part of a larger religious community of persons from across the United States. I take it you knew that when you were doing that, that this was against the law. Yes. yes. Not that praying is against the law, but praying in that place or congregating in That's that right. place. That's right. That's right. Even That's if right. you had not been praying and just been present there, you would have been subject to arrest, correct? That's right. That's right. And it was a decision made, I would say, very, very carefully by about 300 people uh, each, each of those two times um, and, and decided upon as, as a witness to concern about the escalating arms race uh, in the hopes of drawing more attention to the problem of, of our, our, the military character uh, of our country and our, uh, our defense systems in this country and as a way of perhaps uh, helping persuade, I guess, persuade people uh, of the urgency of the issue. Um, also, we saw... And as a matter of fact, you did go to jail then? Well, just overnight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just overnight. But yes, we, we were all arrested, and we did, in fact, go to jail. And it ended up being, I suppose, one of the, one of the, the more uh, buoyant... Uh, evenings I spent in my life because once in fact we had we had been arrested and put in jail we were 
together, we prayed together, we sang hymns together, and we even managed to win the goodwill of our guards who stood outside of the uh, cell and who directed us in our music <laughs> because they claimed we were not keeping proper beat with the men who were farther, who were in cells farther down the corridor. So, so it was a good evening, and we felt that uh, we felt that um, we had, I guess, mustered the courage to do something we had thought about and prayed about for a considerable uh, length of time. I Can don't know if you have questions. Well, about yeah, I would know what I'd like to do, Pat, with it is to take up what seemed to me the various elements that are involved and to. Um, to try to to examine that experience, I think that that's a good way to to go about this thing. Uh, the first thing I noticed you said is that there was a gathering where people talked about what they were going to do, discussed it, and tried to make a prudent decision. In other words, the people who went into this knew that they were subject to arrest. They knew what they were about. They knew that they had a particular goal in mind or a witness point to make. Um, and that would seem important in, in acts of civil disobedience, that people have carefully thought through the matter. Uh, some moralists say that it's very important that it be taken up as sort of a last resort, that uh, that you couldn't um, just do it in a frivolous fashion. You could say, well, we've tried other means of trying to uh, reduce the arms race, for example. We have already uh, wit written our congresspersons, or we have tried to influence our government, and it goes on and on, and therefore we are going to decide to escalate our opposition and, and to move into the civil disobedience. So there is the element of deliberation. Of, That's right. And, and That's I right. notice you put it in a prayerful context, too, which I think out of a Christian framework we would like to add to it, that, that one ought not do this lightly, but one also ought to do it in uh, connection with the great God, with trying to discern the will of God, because it, it is a serious business. We had in fact spent a couple of days uh, in workshops and even in preparing for the civil disobedience itself so that it would be done uh, non-violently so that uh, we would for instance not even resist the police which we came to to see as an act of violence to them if they would have to for instance carry all of us over to the paddy wagons or whatever that we would be inflicting a kind of a violence upon them because there were a lot of us and that that would have been a very uh, tedious task for them if we simply went limp. So we were encouraged not to, to go willingly, to go cheerfully, to to not give any uh, uh, opposition to, to those who were arresting us, but to be cooperative and, and friendly and speak with them about what we were doing and why we were doing it. So I would say that you know, we, we were prepared for the possible consequences, but we also did it in the context of uh, looking at the gospel and seeing what the call of the gospel was and uh, and and trying to do it um, uh, in sync with the call of our God who asks us to be peacemakers uh, in a society that seemed bent on uh, uh, creating a context where violence and the ultimate, you know, annihil annihilating violence uh, seemed to be becoming more and more of a possibility. Pat, I was thinking that one of the uh, dangers of all of this is, is that there would be fostered a disrespect for the law. I know those who oppose uh, civil disobedience as a tactic to uh, improve society or overcome unjust laws and so on say that it will backfire, that it will hurt the overall feeling about the law, the importance that we are a nation under laws and we are expected to keep them and so on, and most of us expect that generally, and we all know that society runs better if the laws are kept. And so some people would say, well, what's happening here is you're undercutting respect for the law in general. You know, somebody would say, well, you as a sister of mercy are out there getting put in jail. That's a bad example for your students, for example. Then they think they can break the law and smoke pot or something like that. So I, I think that question has to has to be faced when we when we look at uh, the whole question of civil disobedience. Okay, and that's a good point. And I'm glad you brought that up, Jim, because I happen to have an answer. <laughs> I think that we. Uh, <laughs> you usually do uh, have an answer to everything. Of course, you know, I, I think we have a strong tendency in in this culture to identify uh, what is legal with what is moral. Uh, for instance, uh, I think there are many persons who came to a new position on abortion. Well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm making this up. But 
I suspect that there probably are some persons, let me put it this way, uh, who feel that because abortion is legal, it must be all right. Otherwise, you know, the law would not allow it. And so I, I think we often tend to identify tightly what is legal with what is moral and have to remember that as, as Judaic Christians, we believe that there is a higher authority than the state and that this higher authority is the authority of God. And I think we also recall historically that there was a time in this country when, um, when slavery was legal, but in the minds of many, many persons, certainly not moral, and they risked civil disobedience acts in order to help slaves escape to Canada or to the free north, the free northern states. And, and so I, I, think, I think your point is well taken, that we don't preach a frivolous attitude toward law, but a discerning attitude toward law and an ability to recognize that not necessarily is every law moral and not necessarily uh, is every l civil law in sync with the higher law and authority of our God to whom we owe ultimate allegiance. Well, you've put that in a helpful theological framework, um, I, and I think that we, I would have to go along with that in saying ultimately our conscience is attuned to the call of God that uh, he that it's the great God that uh, you know has set the framework of the world and put the intelligibility in the world and that it's that God that we are responsive to in our Judeo-Christian framework we have a call response ethic God speaks a word and expects uh, his people to be faithful in responding to it so I mean there's no doubt that that call echoes in our own conscience I I, I would certainly agree with that I also agree with your distinction between legal and moral, and that uh, moral is the, is the more important category in that sense. We need to be moral people, and sometimes if that takes us in opposition to the law, then uh, so be it in a way. But that would be the higher call of conscience for sure. So, I mean, I think that you, that you said you did have an answer. I mean, that does seem to make sense to me. Uh, do you think, too, that people who are involved in that would have some sort of responsibility along that line to, to make it clear that they have respect for the law, that this isn't done, uh, you know, I, the framework we put it in, that there's a higher law, mm -hmm. but yes. that doesn't mean that there's no respect given to the civil law. That's right. That That's the right. civil law remains uh, important, it's, it seems to me. Um, that uh, we, 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 the society runs better this way. We need it. We don't want to foster disrespect for it. That's right. We, we certainly don't. And, and that's why also in, in the two demonstrations I was a part of, we were very careful, for instance, about the sorts of signs that we carried, you know, that we were not uh, defaming anyone, that we were not damning anyone, uh, to, to be very, very careful, to be respectful. Uh, in our language as much as we, we could while still claiming that we were uh, very concerned, concerned to the point of being willing, of course, to, to civilly disobey. But, but there was an effort to, to demonstrate, I think, respect for the law. For instance, the local uh, authorities had been told that we were going to do this. The police knew it, and they were ready, and in fact they were waiting with their, their paddy wagons and their buses. Um, they knew about how many were going to be arrested so that they would have facilities prepared. And in every step of the way were we cooperative with them as they were with us. I certainly in, in neither case experienced any roughness or violence on the part of the police. And in fact, a couple of them said to different ones of us, you know, if I weren't, you know, if I weren't a cop, I would be there with you today. I respect the cause and I agree with mm -hmm. what you're doing, which was very uh, an interesting statement yeah, from well those representing sure. the civil law. Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, that is that really is uh, an interesting kind of thing. I think too. If I, I think of the um, uh, Martin Luther King's approach in the South and the the lunch counters and so on and the sit-ins there, it, it seems to me that there was also this sense that the law can work for us. We d we disagree with this law. We don't think this this law uh, really reflects where we're at as a society, the best of our moral judgment, uh, but that w we know we have to get new laws. That's we right. have to have laws That's that right. will protect people, really. So it wasn't a disregard for law, but it's saying let's get a law that reflects the public philosophy or consensus at this time, and then the, let's make sure that, that that law then is kept or that we are faithful to it. So we have civil rights laws 
laws that enabled people to vote and so on. And I think that brought um, civil law back into a positive context. It isn't like we want to move into an, a society where anarchy no, reigns that's right. at all, but that okay. the rule of law will really serve human beings. That's what we're after. Agreed. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, I, I think it's a, a twist on that, that that brings back the value of, of the law. I think your mentioning of anarchy, our anarchy is very helpful because... You're absolutely right in, in in suggesting that people could see those who break the law as those who who look upon it lightly, who essentially don't have respect for it, and who tend to be perhaps somewhat anarchic. And and I I think it's good to have that that balance and to recognize that out of perhaps the best and most consistent acts of civil disobedience in this country, in this century, in fact came new laws, and and that. That certainly is one of the long-term and, and, and most outstanding results, and certainly the one that Martin Luther King must look down on and be, be very grateful for. I think that we could uh, talk about one of the effects of all of this in terms of the educational side of it. Um, when Henry David Thoreau uh, refused to pay his taxes, he once said, I'm doing my part to educate my fellow countrymen. Uh, he saw his civil disobedience precisely as an educational tool. It's a way of consciousness raising, of getting people to look at a situation, to perhaps probe more deeply than they had before. I think it's a way of cutting through uh, people's lethargy. I mean, there's always the sense that, well, this is how society is, and you expect it to be this way, and it takes an awful lot of gumption and... Uh, really energy to rise above that and to see anything different. And so I think Thoreau saw himself as trying to, to bring this out and say, let's get people to look more deeply at what is involved. I think in his essay on civil disobedience, he, he simply calls for people to be reflective about what they're doing and not simply like, like dumb animals to walk wherever the government may happen to tell them to walk. And, and he was referring specifically to the draft, to young people who love their freedom, who had no desire to fight, but who, when told to, simply picked up their weapons and walked off, often to their death, like so many unthinking lemmings marching to the sea. And, uh, Is that he, your metaphor or his? There? That's mine. Okay. <laughs> the, the Go ahead. You, you went from oh, Thoreau's right. from essay Thoreau to your to own Katz, essay. Yes, yes. Sorry about that. Well, that's all right. But, I just but wanted his to... call is to, to think, to think of what they're doing, uh, to not, in a sense, let... let uh, let the state have a power over them uh, which, they, um, which they are not morally in, a, in accord with. And, and uh, if they are not morally in accord, to recognize that they have to follow their own consciences uh, ultimately and, and live with themselves, which, of course, he did by, by going to jail. And there's the marvelous anecdote of Emerson who came and paid the tax that he refused to pay and saying, Thoreau, what are you doing inside that jail? And Thoreau, knowing Emerson ideologically, was on the same side, saying, Emerson, what are you doing outside it? Yes, that is, <laughs> that's a good one. And <laughs> I like that. Yes, and uh, I mean, it's one of those sharp, pointed comments yes. that, that ends up being directed at all of us. That's it right. It has a universality about it. Uh, yes. you know, why are you living your comfortable ways when there are important questions here? And... Uh, things that we need to redress, mm -hmm. grievances that have to be dealt with. Yeah. So the, so the educational side of this, I, I, like, I mean, it is a type of consciousness raising, and it, and it could, uh, I think that's the role of the prophets in a sense. They're, they're supposed to break us out of our ordinary way of thinking. We get conventional, and conformity becomes part of our mental set. And y a lot of times you need a jarring force here that, that will cut through and say, hey, think about it in a different way. So people like Thoreau are a good example of that. And, and certainly wherever there is a public witness, such as occurs when there's an act of civil disobedience, it, it, it jars people, it startles them, and I think this is the beginning of education. You know, why are these people doing this? You know, why is it that, you know, that, that they are at, at such a, a different point from, from, our, from our national policy? Often it becomes the opportunity to, to interact with people who walk along on the sidewalk, who, who are curious, who are willing to take a brochure and, and, and look at the reasoning. And this is often a part of civil disobedience, by the way, is to publicize and to have prepared pamphlets or brochures to, to distribute to people who might come by, to make statements to the press, uh, which is a way of reaching a larger audience. So the educational dimension is certainly, certainly significant. 
It would seem like a certain prudence is needed in doing that well. I'm, I'm reminding of the case of Brian Wilson, oh, if I'm remembering yes. correctly. Um, he's the man, September 1st, 1987, was sitting on the railroad tracks and uh, thinking of, of blocking the train or getting the train to stop, which was carrying uh, munitions of some sort. Um, nuclear I, weapons, was or it, parts uh-huh. of nuclear weapons, Parts yes. of weapons, yes. Mm-hmm. And... Um, Uh, found himself uh, not getting off the track in time and being mangled very severely uh, by the train um, and requiring extensive surgery afterwards. He lived, but his head was cut open badly, and uh, I think his legs were were both severed, if I'm not mistaken. That's right. right. Um, That certainly drew a lot of publicity, and um, I... I don't know why I raise it, except it is an act of civil disobedience to be sitting on the track. That's right. Um, I wonder what sort of witness that ended up making with people, uh, whether, you know, people could see the point of it or or um, did they end up thinking, well, this was foolishness or what? That might depend on <laughs> which people you would talk to. I suspect there are some who see him as a quasi-martyr. Uh, for the cause of turning around the arms race, uh, someone who uh, maybe somewhat inadvertently, and, and uh, I, I haven't heard the last word on that yet, somewhat inadvertently became a victim to his own zeal uh, to help turn around the arms race by stopping this particular train and drawing attention to the fact that there are trains going through our states that carry parts of nuclear weapons and that if they would be involved in some sort of accident on the tracks would endanger entire communities. Uh, with radiation, and yet we we have accepted this, and and we don't we the general populace don't pay much attention, and so there is a small group of white train watchers, as they're called, who have in fact tried to slow down and draw attention to the passage of these these trains and trucks through their communities. I suspect many persons would say, yes, it was foolish on his part. He got what he deserved. He shouldn't have been there. And, you know, I don't know how we can determine where where the public mm-hmm. would come down without some sort of general poll, because it may depend on where we stand ideologically regarding nuclear arms. Well, I'm sure that's true, and we, people would react in different ways. But somehow there, there's some difference here that I want to try to bring out. When you um, prayed and were uh, arrested and went to jail, you didn't. you saw that, it seems to me, more as a symbolic action, a, an education action. It, it wasn't going to directly do anything uh, in a one-to-one way. In other words, it wasn't you're going to stand there and therefore a train wasn't going to take uh, parts to make a weapon someplace. Whereas uh, the notion that you're going to stop a train and therefore slow down the arms race uh, as though there's a pragmatic value to it or a literal uh, stopping of, of the arms race, I mean, that begins to border on uh, the bazaar, it seems to me. I mean, well. in other words, well, <laughs> well, no, put it, well, let me put it this way to you. Right. There's two different things there. I mean, pragmatically, to think you're going to stop the arms race by getting in the way of a train, it doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. If that's meant I'll to be a that. witness as a consciousness-raising thing, that's a different story. All right, all right. And, and my, my hunch is certainly that that was the intent, probably. Would, and, and one, of course, could lead to the other. But if indeed the train had stopped, it no doubt would have been newsworthy, and, and it certainly would have aroused, as I'm sure happened, the community to the fact that uh, these very, very dangerous trains carrying these weapons of destruction are going through our community. We are, yeah. tolerating, we are tolerating their transportation of these lethal weapons, these dangerous lethal weapons through our community, and perhaps the community would have said, uh-uh, we don't want this, we don't want them coming through our particular um, city or community or whatever it might be. Still, though, I mean, the, the notion that this is going to, uh, the stopping of a train is going to slow down the arms race or something, I mean, that, that, that doesn't make sense to me. It, it, as a symbolic action, it makes sense. It seems okay. to me that's the value of getting together and praying ahead of time and thinking about what you're going to do. Yes. It, it, that ought to become clear. That, that It ought to be clear whether you're doing a symbolic action or whether you're doing some action that is politically effective. If you write your congressperson and say, I'm against the arms race, you expect them not to vote 
uh, or to vote against this uh, MX missile, and then maybe we won't build it. You Jim, know, I that's, think that's the pragmatic. two often overlap, though. For instance, think of the demonstrations during the Vietnam era against the war. In a sense, it was a symbolic uh, witness to opposition, but ultimately affected a whole lot of people in Washington's votes and, and turned around and, 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 and attitudes. Well, it ultimately meant well, that the people we that were, would be demonstrating, though, ought to understand that, that that's a symbolic action that, that is designed to have some sort of other pragmatic effect. I mean, it's just very different than thinking you're going to stop a train and th- that's going to slow down the arms race. I, 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 I don't w- see the distinction quite as clearly <laughs> as you do, but no. I won't argue with you any longer. Well, okay, <laughs> we'll leave that go. And uh, let, me, let me take up one more side of this thing. Then. All right. And that is that um, there is uh, a power in, uh, in uh, civil disobedience. There's a persuasive power. Yes. It works. There, well, I think is that maybe I'm on the same point. I mean, Gandhi made his salt march work so that he was able to free the whole country of India. Martin Luther King made it work. There is a pragmatic value, but it, it's, it's not direct. It has uh, the power to, to get the body politic thinking in a different way eventually to influence votes. So what Martin Luther King did, he got civil rights legislation. That's what, that's what happened. Yes. In other words, I'm trying to point out where the persuasive power of this civil disobedience is. All right. I think it's back in the education and then eventually in the being able to get people to respond. Are you are you (laughs) want to respond to that or not? (laughs) I I guess I'm still just mildly confused. I guess I see all of them as as interlocked. The symbolic action which which I think always is done out of a desire for the change, which is the ultimate, the systemic change. All right. I'm going to give you the last word. You got ten seconds. Oh, ten seconds. So as far as what was his name goes, I I think it was perhaps a bit foolhardy, but certainly an act of courage and conscience. Good. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> You've been listening to Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. Today, Father Basic talked with Sister Patricia Snap, who is Associate Professor of Literature at Siena Heights College. The topic of this week's Reflections was Civil Disobedience, Personal and Theological Perspectives. If you have any comments on today's show or suggestions for future programs, please write Father James Basic. Catholic Campus Minister, 2086 Brookdale Drive, Toledo, Ohio, 43606. Funding for this program was provided by the Catholic Communications Commission of the Diocese of Toledo.